let it play, boy. Obscurities channel. Um, hopefully this is the last time I try to film this intro because I can't stop stumbling over my words, but welcome back. Uh, for those of you guys who saw the previous video, which was about a week and a half, two weeks ago, you will remember that we kind of just gave you a little update on where the hell we went, where we are now, what's been happening at home, and what's been going on with the channel, and the direction we're going to take things with this channel moving forward. Uh, for those who saw that video, you heard me say that every week moving forward we were going to put out a new episode. That was not counting the couple weeks that I took to get our ducks in a row, so to speak, moving forward. Um, but from this video on, every single week there will be a new episode. Now, none of the episodes are going to be full, complete care guides or anything by any means. They are going to be separated into kind of different segments so that way you're not being overflowed with information um, in one video. And we will do different playlist categories so you can go back and reference different things, rather it be uh, feeding videos or breeding and incubating and pairing videos or husbandry and basic setup and advanced setups or medicating um, or identifying certain things. There's a lot to come, there's a lot that we wanna do. And so I hope that this channel is going to start to provide something a little bit more useful to a lot of you guys who have been supporting us for so long. Now, without dragging the intro on, we're gonna move right into today's video. For those of you guys who follow us on Instagram, um, we went and took a poll on our story. For those of you guys who don't, make sure you go follow arboreal.obscurities. I'll put it somewhere down here below. That's where you're gonna see all of our daily updates and posts and uh, be more involved with things like our polls for future videos. Now we did a poll and we asked you guys if you wanted to see Barnex scrub pythons or black headed cat snakes for this first episode. And to my surprise I really did think that it was going to be scrubs because we haven't posted a lot of them, but it was uh, Boyga nigriceps. There was 5% votes went to scrubs and the rest went to Boyga, which is pretty cool for me to see. Um, so yeah, I'm happy that today's episode is going to be talking about one of my favorite snakes on the planet, the black-headed cat snake. Now, like I said with the categories, um, today's episode is not going to be kind of a one or the other. Every time that I introduce a new animal on this channel or a, a new snake to this series, we're going to start things off with just talking a little bit about misconceptions you may read about them, their their husbandry um, in captivity on a basic level. We're going to talk about their climate and ranges and natural distribution. We will talk a little bit about their scientific name. Um, and then I'm just gonna show you a variety of different animals, everything from hatchling babies up to full-blown breeding adults. And hopefully today's episode will be something cool for you. It'll be an introductory introductory to Boyega nigriceps and then uh, we'll do stuff similar to this moving forward every single week. So, like I said, without dragging this on too long, let's get some snakes out. Let's start talking about Boyega. I'll be right back. All right, and the first one that we're going to take a look at is gonna be this little one. This little red worm of a nigriceps. Now, I took this one out first just so I can start off by giving you guys an idea of how small these snakes actually start out. Um, they are itty, itty bitty. So that can de defer a lot of people from, deter a lot of people from wanting to breed these animals because the babies do start off so small, which can make them um, fairly difficult to get feeding. 
but these guys have been taking food very, very easily. The nice thing that I will say about Boygan Agriceps is as babies, they are not reluctant to bite. They have quite the spunky little personality and uh, these guys have chomped on me quite a few times and Allie has been chomped on these a couple of times and that's going to take me into our first topic, which is actually kind of a misconception that I recently read online. Um, these guys do have quite the potent little venom if they need to utilize it. And if they chew on you, um, they have, there's not a lot of study done on Nigriceps venom, but there have been studies done. And those studies that were done um, found out that their toxicity level, their, their venom levels are comparable to the um, Australian death adder. Now, for those of you guys who know, that is a very, very potent snake. Um, but for those of you guys who also know, there are some terrible places to gain information. One of those terrible places being Wikipedia. And the thing that I want to talk about that just, I've recently read stumbling across Wikipedia for, for little updates on stuff, because although it is a terrible place for information, every now and then you can cite something decent from it. So I was kind of just scrolling back through to see if anything had changed. And the only thing I noticed that had changed was someone who is not actually studying these animals because the public can edit Wikipedia pages, which is not a good thing, um, changed it from their toxicity comparison comparisons being from a death adder to a copperhead. Now you've just taken one of the deadliest snakes on the planet and one of the least deadly venomous snakes on the planet and said that it could be either one, which blows my mind. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to actually put up a couple pictures of the last recent time that Allie got chewed on um, by this animal right here. It was only for a minute or so while she was helping get some shed off. And the amount that her finger swelled up from a tiny one, a little guy. And I'm going to put that those photos up right here. You can see that she had some some swelling on her finger now this is like an hour after the bite right when she got to school and then i'm going to put up another photo right here this is a week after the bite and uh i don't know if you'll be able to see all that well but i'll put a photo up of her um her bicep the underside of her bicep right here and you will see that it created bruising all the way up basically into her armpit there is a decent toxicity level in these little snakes. So don't believe everything that you read online. Um, now I said that they can be tricky to feed and things like that, and they can, um, any boy can. And for those of you guys who have bred them before, you know that you do a lot of assist feeding on baby boy until a certain point. One thing that is very cool that I'm happy to say though, is not only were these, these babies hatched out in a shipping box in the back of a moving truck um, and we'll touch on that in just a moment but they've been eating off of the tongs frozen thawed food since the get-go so really really cool um, I don't know if I just said this already or not but they're, they're not hesitant to, to bite things um, they are fairly defensive and when they do bite they do chew and they do try to cause damage so that actually ends up working in your favor when it comes to, to feeding babies and things like that so um, I did say that these were hatched out in the back of a moving truck. I filmed this intro so many times this morning that I apologize if I repeat myself or if I think that I said something that I haven't said already. Um, I've been stumbling over my words all morning. There's a ton to do around the house and I'm just trying to make sure I put this video out for you guys. But these were hatched in the back of a moving truck. If you saw our previous video, you saw that I talked about how we moved from Arizona to Virginia and it was three days and we brought all the animals and we had them all shipped or packed up in the back in insulated shipping boxes with hot packs and cold packs depending on the temperatures outside or in the back of the truck um, regulated by Bluetooth thermostats that we were checking from our phones in the cab and we played it very, very safely. They came into hotel rooms every night with us, got opened up, got fresh air, got clean water. We care about these animals um, and I wasn't able to put my faith in just shipping them so I wanted to keep an eye on them the entire way. I trust myself better than the FedEx drivers who deliver half of these animals so I figured that was the best approach and it worked out. Um, we used that same method to continue incubating these eggs because this was a clutch that was laid 
probably 95 days before we had to leave, which was not intended. We had separated Grim and Grell. Um, Grell dropped a late clutch after they had been separated. And here we are. I didn't want to leave them behind. I wanted to take the risk in taking them with us. And, and here we are. And so I'm going to put up a video of how awesome these little snakes are and show you this one right here, tong feeding a frozen thawed pinky mouse. No problem, right here. You'll kind of get an idea for, for just how spunky these little guys are and how good of feeders they are. Now that is just about none of the other Boyega in the room. Um, everybody else for the most part is still being assist fed and probably will be for a couple more months until they kind of click on. But one thing I want to note on Nigriceps that make them such an awesome snake is they tend to eat better than most as babies, which can make them a really nice segue into breeding Boyega. Um, I wouldn't have known that when I bought them. They are what started me on Boyega. Um, they are my favorite species. They have a special place in my heart for many, many reasons. But if you are looking to get into breeding Boyega um, and want something that may not have to be assist or force fed for long periods of time before they kind of trigger on for you, this is an awesome little species. Uh, now, I'm going to show you if I can get this to focus some of the cool little features. I mean, they can have this is a much more striped one. Uh, the other one that's in the enclosure with it is much, much more speckled. But you can just see um, that they're fairly reactive. Now, it's actually good that this one's not striking right now. Um, I don't want them to just be striking at whatever. But it is nice come feeding time for them to have uh, that bit of spunk on them. And uh, I don't know if I pointed this out early on, but these guys do not have the black head yet. There is a reason for that. They do not gain that black head until they start to reach sexual maturity. Um, so until they start to phase into being an actual adult. And the animal that I'm going to pull out next for you is she is a sexually mature adult uh, she came in as a wild import and actually had a small clutch of eggs in her now those eggs were infertile she did get them out safely though which i'm happy about um but she's still going to be a kind of a small snake she's a lot bigger than this guy but she is still a lot smaller than the other adults so i'm going to put this little one away because his range is right here at home. That is his habitat. So we're going to take one that came from the wild and we'll talk a little bit about habitat. I'll give you one more look at this little red worm. Focus it up for you guys. Really, really cool little snakes. Definitely a bit touchy still. But yeah, otherwise really cool little snakes. Got a little bit of size on them once you actually get them to uncoil things. But we're going to put her away and uh, I'm going to grab the next animal. I'll be right back. Alright you guys, so this next animal is Valkyrie. Now like I said, Valkyrie is a, a very young female, so she doesn't have a ton of size on her yet but she does have that little dark colored head on her now as you can see these guys are fairly easy going compared to some of the others I'm essentially one of the Boyega that I'm not too worried about biting when they get a little bit larger, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the range and where these guys actually come from. Now, Valkyrie here is a Malaysian nigriceps. The Boyga nigriceps are going to be found throughout a majority of Indonesia into Thailand and Malaysia. Um, now, they are not going to inhabit 
the exact same area as a mangrove, and they are also not going to inhabit the exact same areas as something like a Boiga cynodon. Boiga nigriceps are going to be found in more of a lowland to upper midland um, range of Indonesia or Thailand or Malaysia. Um, now, she has a lot of uh, like a green brown kind of coloration to her, which is something you see a little bit more of in like the Singapore Javan variety of Malaysia, which is really cool. You don't see them this like almost uni color like her all that often. Part of why I took her out to show you guys instead of some of the others. Uh, just a little bit of variety for you. But these guys are going to be a Southeast Asian animal. Um, now they also get their name cat snake from these really cool little cat eyes that they have. If I can get it to focus for you. Here's what we'll do. I'll put a picture up right here for the cat eyes that they have and for the black head that they have. Now, these guys are a medium to larger sized boyega. They are bigger than a lot of them, um, but they're also smaller than a lot of them. So for things like Cynodon and uh, Dendrophala melanota, these guys are kind of a small boyega, but compared to things um, like Siamensis or um, Jaspidia or Drapezii or Binculuensis. They're actually fairly close in size to the Binkus, um, but these guys are going to still be bigger than a large variety of other Boiga. Now, when I say large, they are going to be slender bodied, but they are going to get longer. Um, they're going to get to about five and a half. Maybe they'll push six feet. It's rare. Uh, the males do tend to be a little bit larger than the females, so maybe a male can push about six feet in length. Um, but it's a long, slender six feet, and by no means do they feel like big snakes. They really feel uh, they really feel like you're working with like a rat snake or something. They have kind of the same responses as well. Now they can be a little bit touchy. Um, they're touchy on the tail, of course, but these guys are made to use that tail fairly prehensilely. Um, they're very very arboreal snakes. They're designed to be able to use this light body to stretch across tree branches and things like that to reach um, some harder to, to reach spots where they're finding birds nests um, or amphibians or other lizards that are firing up the tree to get away from other predators on the ground. These guys are designed to pick those animals off. Uh, they use that rear fanged venom that they have to bite down and chew in and immobilize a lot of their prey items. Now of course if they're eating eggs and things like that they're not going to be needing to use any kind of venom. Um, but if you go back to the previous video with the Cynodon, you will see some cool video clips of the Cynodon eating eggs and using that back fang as more like an anchor to pull the egg into their mouth. Um, for frogs and things like that, it is designed to deflate the inflated lung that a frog will swell in order to keep from being swallowed. Then also in the midst of deflating that lung, they are going to be neutralizing the prey item and beginning to break down body tissue and things like that so that that is easier to not only digest but to swallow as well. These are very, very cool little snakes. Um, and as you can see, I mean, the, the temperament on them is really awesome as well. Not too afraid of having these animals in my face. Um, they're not strikey like that. They're really not even too movement strikey, especially once they, like, Trying to see if upset her a little bit. Um, this snake is not a snake that I'd be worried about holding on, if anything. A lot of the time, your your nigriceps tags are going to be exactly that. They're going to be tags. There's not a lot of hold and chew unless it's a food item. They're very movement and scent oriented, if you can't tell by those big old cat eyes and the amount that that tongue is flicking. Um, they're using a lot of senses. They're not a heat-seeking animal. And they're just not a really defensive animal by any means. They're very curious. So, so long as you can understand that curiosity and work with it, these can be a very, very rewarding snake to keep. And again, this is Valkyrie. She is a Malaysian. Now, Malaysia is the one range where you're going to get more of your variants. Um, a lot of the Thai and 
Indonesian stuff is going to be fairly one colored, um, like brick dark red. I'm going to show you Grim next, and he is the, the, the father, the male to the sire to those babies um, that I just had out. Valkyrie has not been bred to anybody yet. She just had the one clutch that she came in with that we just got out of her that was a no-go anyways. Um, but I'm going to get Grim out next, and I'm going to show you just how variant they can be in color. Now take a good look at Miss Valkyrie here. She is definitely a washed out gray pink, almost brown looking. And when the direct light's not on her, she definitely looks more of like an olive green, which is really, really interesting. Um, now the setup for these guys is fairly simple. Like I said, they're going to be low to mid lend tropical. Um, now when I say tropical though, they do like things a little bit drier because they are inland a little bit and they are not on the coast. It is not quite as cool. It is not as damp and moist. They are spending more time in dense, slightly drier areas inhabiting um, rather the branches of the trees that they're cruising across or they will actually find spots amongst the leaf litter on the forest floor and they will hide underneath that stuff. Um, so in a lot of these enclosures, we have things like leaf litter um, or places for them to be able to hide underneath, branches for them to climb on, water dishes large enough for them to soak in because they do like to soak as well. They're really good about doing things like that when it comes shedding time. And it looks like Valkyrie's giving you an idea of just how long she actually is Now, like I said, very, very good little snakes. Um, they really just kind of want to explore and hang out. So nothing really too troublesome. Um, fairly easy to set up and to keep. You do want to keep their water very clean. You will probably want to use a mister um, and spray them from the bottle for the first couple month, months just so they get kind of a hang on drinking and you can even spray the bottle at the water dish and they are smart animals. They will pick up on those water droplets. They eat a variety of things from lizards to frogs to I feed day old chicks to mine. They will eat rodents like mice and other small rats. They will eat things like quail eggs as well. So once established, they're a very, very good little feeder and just a really fun and rewarding animal to keep. I'm probably gonna keep saying that, but these really are one of my favorite snakes and for so, so, so many reasons. Now I'm gonna let Miss Valkyrie go back into her enclosure, which is actually this one right behind me. And if you can see, um, it is fairly simply set up. Let's see if I can just take you over with me. Fairly simply set up, um, there is a, that light's blowing them out, but there are some branches for her to climb back in here. There's a hide that at the moment is flipped over because that's what she was underneath that sits behind. Some branches, a water dish, um, lots of moss, and some deeper substrate for her to be able to dig in. So yeah, they, uh, they're not too difficult to set up. They're super rewarding. They're really, really beautiful. They're a little bit touchy if you touch them on the neck, um, but they're easily handleable. You just gotta get them associated with that touch. You gotta get them used to feeling, feeling you, which is another reason why I highly suggest against using things like snake hooks on your, especially on your smaller bodied boyga, but realistically on all of your boyga, they just respond better to natural feel, um, having that support. Sure, they're going to be a little bit touchy, but I'd rather a warm hand bump against them than a hard, cold hook. And that's just my philosophy on it. These are not an animal that's going to kill you. Um, now, I'm not going to say that like they never could. We don't know. Um, we're still learning more and more about them every single day. But as of right now, as the way things stand, I mean, there really is no danger to holding your cat snake like this. So long as you're not letting them sit there and chew on you if you do accidentally take a bite. 
if you do take a bite and they do decide to chew, just grab some Listerine, some rubbing alcohol. Um, to be honest, you can even, these guys, since their fangs sit so far back, you can gently use like a debit card to just kind of lift their mouth um, and they will let go pretty easily. Again, if they hold on, they're not really known for holding on, but it is easy to work around um, and you really don't have much to worry about. I got slapped by a cranky Grell, who is the mother, with the reason that I'm not going to pull her out is she's actually gravid again right now. So I got slapped by her right on the finger with a very frothy and hungry mouth the other day. She did not hold on. She was just moody because I was messing with her and checking on her. I didn't even know she was gravid at the time, so I was wondering why she was sitting in a weird spot. That goes to show why. Um, but yeah, she, she bit me pretty good on my finger and nothing, literally nothing, no swelling, no irritation, no nothing. And my finger was covered in her venom and saliva, nothing. So I'm, I'm not too, too concerned about these animals actually envenomating anybody unless you do sit and let them chew. I will be completely honest. Um, Allie was curious and since it was a small baby that was chewing on her, she took it upon herself to let it bite her a little bit more and to see how she was going to react to the animal and sometimes that can be a good or it can be a bad idea um it's probably always a bad idea to let yourself get envenomated but if you're genuinely curious and it's your animal and it's your life and it's your business so if that's something that you want to figure out if you're reactive to or not that's one way to do it um, otherwise, best thing to do is just work gently and slowly with these animals and um, never take a bite to begin with. They, I've been bit two times in years and years working with these animals and both times were like in the last week. Maybe I've been bit three or four times, but two of those times were in the last week and it's just because one was a newborn little baby who's spunky as all hell and one was a, a pregnant female. So really good animals. Coming from Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Southeast Asia, I did see another weird Wikipedia edit that was saying that these went into China, um, and then in parentheses it said Guanzi. This is not the Guanzi cat snake or Boyga guanziensis. I don't know of much documentation of these coming from China. Um, now, they could. I don't know everything about them, um, and that's something that I'm going to probably look a little bit further into to see if there are, and if so, what they look like. I'm genuinely curious, uh, but these guys are going to be most commonly found throughout most of Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, and they can be anywhere from olive and pink peachy colors to red and green to totally cherry red like Grim, who I'm about to get out. So without making this video super long, let me grab the last snake and let's wrap things up a little bit. I'll be right back. All right, you guys, and finally, here is Grim. Grim's going to be a little bit easier for me to show you because I can kind of stay in frame and talk to you. And he's big enough to be seen. Uh, this is Grim. Grim is a full grown male boy Gnigriceps. Um, just to show you guys what I, when I was talking about length, um, he's a very, very long snake. Oh, I'm trying to stretch him out a little for you. I have a six foot reach, um, arm span left to right. He definitely stretches all the way across both arms. Um, so he's probably pushing right around six feet or so. He's definitely a long snake. If I hold him from the top of my head to the ground, he definitely reaches the ground. So this is a better example of uh, a large boy Gnigriceps. Now I've had this guy for a few years now. He came in from uh, Dan Maleri actually a couple years ago at the Pomona show on in California Sorry, I'm just getting a little piece of shit off of him um, And he is the sire or father to all of our babies right now this guy Breeds like crazy um, There is no female that is not good enough for him. He is Just about always down and he keeps us filling the incubator and I have no problem with that at all um, super, super good temperament. And like I was saying about these animals just being worked with a little bit and they can be really awesome snakes. 
when he first came in, he was a nightmare. He was, supposedly, he was a nightmare. He was actually kind of swindled out from under me um, by a coworker and a not good boss at the time that thought it would be funnier after this animal came in um, before I had actually paid for it to sell it to someone else and rub it in my face that I didn't get it. it sounds really cruel. It's for sure a dick move, but uh, long story short, karma, um, that person ended up temporarily having to live out of his car and had to sell his snakes. And the guy of the shop that this snake was getting sold to, because God forbid they offer it to me, was a friend of mine who called me right when it arrived or right as he got offered and asked if I wanted it still. And I told him, absolutely. I got this animal and he had a very bad respiratory infection. He had mouth rot. He had stuck shed. He was not doing good. And we put a little bit of time and effort into him. And you can see now that he is a pristine, perfect example of a Boygan Agriceps. Super tame, um, but apparently with the previous owner, and again, I'm just going to chalk it up to bad energy and bad vibes and not great people. Um, with the previous owner, this animal struck faces. He escaped constantly. He was not an animal that they were having fun having at home. And ever since he's been home with me, he's been a delight, um, a sheer pleasure. He has given me baby nigriceps. He has been nothing but an absolute sweetheart. Um, this is an animal I don't worry about at all. Grell I've had even longer and I'm a little more even hesitant with her from time to time, but this is an animal I trust completely. He's never tried to bite me, not once. Strong food drive, great breeder, great animal, um, defensive in the enclosure if you go in there and just mess with him, but a fantastic, not only ambassador for his species, but just pet snake in general. Um, and I don't call a lot of my animals pet snakes too often because most of them don't act like pets, they just act like snakes. This guy, is a fantastic pet snake. Um, now I'm keeping him and you're going to want to keep all your Boyga right around the mid eighties. Um, anywhere from like 78 to 82 on the lower end, um, about 86 to 88 on the higher end are good temperatures for these guys for ambience. If you want to keep them cooler, you can, if you want to keep them warmer, you can. Um, I tend to notice that they just breed a little bit better right around like 82 to 84 degrees. And I don't keep them damp. I keep them dry, but I spray them fairly often. The reason that, or the, the way that I don't keep them damp is I just spray them for short periods of time and give them kind of like a mist multiple times a day rather than like a solid spray and a solid soak. Now, we pointed out with Valkyrie, her color. This is also a Malaysian Nigriceps. Now, his color is very, very different from hers. He is like hot rod red. He is a beautiful, beautiful snake. But from Malaysia, they may not always come out this color. They may be greens, they may be browns, they may be red like this. Um, in Indonesia, they are going to be kind of the darker shade than this, but they are going to be like a solid uniform red as well. And Grim here is a very good example of that black head. See, what a good snake. It just hangs out, not a care in the world. <laughs> Really, really good little animals. Um, really placid, really friendly, um, really curious. Just really, really good snakes. And honestly, I was really excited that you guys voted for Nigriceps for this video. Although we're not getting too crazy into stuff, um, I just wanted to kick things off. Weekly videos are on their way. And um, yeah, with that being said, we're going to pretty much wrap this all up. We kind of went over where these come from, some basic husbandry, um, showed you a little bit about them, and that's it for today. So for those of you guys who are new to the channel, thank you. Um, please subscribe down below, hit that like, uh, that like button, hit the notification bell, that way you know every time that we post or upload a video, there's going to be weekly videos. Go check out Redbubble, buy some of our merch, links in the Instagram. I love you guys, I wouldn't do it without you, and I will see you on another episode. Peace. That feels good!